I apologize for anyone who is at UK North because this is going to look very familiar. Um, so if you want to go and get an early lunch, well, no, there's another talk after me. So <laughs> anyway, carry on. No, let's see. Um, okay, so, um, yeah. So what I'm going to talk about is basically a bit of intro on how UK broadband usage has grown over the last 10 years or so and the associated pricing of it. Then looking at how the Sky Network is structured and um, <coughs> uh, a recent capacity upgrade we've, well, we're still in the process of doing, and then looking at methods we're, we're uh, deploying to uh, cost-reduce the network of delivering capacity. And this is quite co this is co um, complementary to what the BBC were talking about earlier today and is basically our immediate solution, but um, clearly at some point something, we'll need to go something beyond that and then maybe what the BBC were talking about will play in. Um, so traffic is growing. Um, this shows a number of countries. Uh, black at the top is Korea. Um, Sweden is purple. USA is um, brown. And a couple of years' growth, the USA, for example, as with some, has been growing about 20% year on year. Where does Britain feel in, fit, in, fit into this? Well, it's rather startling, actually. That's the UK usage per um, subscriber in gigabytes per line per month. So... Uh, in 2017, where well, I haven't got international figures, but we've got the UK communication market report from Ofcom, the average consumption was about 190 gigs per line per subscriber, way above most other countries, which is pretty remarkable given our apparent uh, low concentration of very high-speed connections. Clearly, a very high-speed connection isn't necessary to deliver lots of usage. Um, and Sky's usage pattern has looked pretty similar. Our, Big rise was a bit earlier, and our uh, volume is a little bit higher, but it's similar to the market. That's actually our, um, the, the volume of traffic in the Sky Network measured slightly differently. It's a bit, a bit hard to read at that scale, but where uh, the pink vertical line is where we are now, and it's crossing about um, 8 terabits um, peak traffic um, delivered to all subscribers. We've got about 6 million subscribers, so that's... Uh, uh, average uh, traffic up a bit over a megabit each. <clears throat> the graph on the right is the um, log scale, which makes it a bit easier to see how the traffic has grown. Back in 2007, when we started measuring this with what, one, and, one and a half million subs, we were doing about 70 gigs peak traffic, where, as I say, we're now at um, 100 times that, eight, eight terabits. Um, growth has slowed down. We saw a huge surge in demand with the rollout of the Sky set-top boxes and the start of BBC iPlayer, really about a 60% year-on-year growth. Um, and it's now slowing down somewhat. Um, the, we've seen a four-fold increase in subscribers over that period, so the per-sub growth is about 30% year-on-year, which is still pretty substantial. Um, now, uh, that's our traffic we have to carry, and it costs money to carry. What about our revenue? Well, it's, it's a somewhat another rather remarkable graph when I put it together. This is how much, basically, the cost in pence per month per kilobits per, uh, and per second. Back in the sort of mid-90s, we had, we had dial-up, and you probably paid about £30 for your phone line and maybe 10 or £20 a month dial-up cost beyond that, so you were paying £40, £50 a month. Then you moved on to the early DSL lines, 512k probably, and around about 2,000, again paying 30 pounds plus another 10 for your broadband. ADSL 2005, moving up to 5, 8 me megabits per second, again a similar price. Um, VDSL, fiber to, the um, fiber to the cabinet and so on in um, early 2010s, um, again 50 megabits and of course higher rates on um, um, GFAST and, and the Virgin network. The price really has not changed. You paid between thirty and fifty pounds a month if, dis if you discount introductory offers. offers. Um, but over twelve years, the access rate and potential bandwidth consumed has increased by a factor of a hundred. Um, so there's been a, 70, a sixty-seven percent year-on-year decrease in the cost per bit, um, which of course means that the actual revenue the uh, ISP is getting is largely unchanged per customer. Um, but you've got to cope with this hugely increased access rate. So that's the challenge we face. 
Um, just going on now to what the Sky Network looks like. It's a um, fairly, fairly similar network. The only difference is we're quite concentrated. We've got four supercore nodes, two in London and then Birmingham and Leeds, and we're almost fully meshed. Um, those gray lines are multiple hundred gig bearers. Um, we've got, in fact, just a, two pairs of fibers running around the country with 8,800 gig wavelengths, lightable on each. Um, so that's our core network. Um, the, um, then we have our provider edge boxes, which also contain the BNG, uh, which are either located in the super core nodes or um, at multiple pops around the country. We've got about 60 pops. Um, and you fan out to those to the exchanges, um, about 3,000 exchanges, uh, BT local loop exchanges, uh, with normally leased lines, um, typically not... Uh, 10 gig or multiple 10, 10 gig out to the exchanges and of course finally the copper pair out to the C CPE equipment um, that's what it looks like that's how we get traffic to the customer gets on the network um, and this initially was where most of our traffic came from peering and transit nodes um, which connect directly into the course um, super core sites and the other source and it's the predominant source now is from um, CDNs which are uh, either located off net and coming through the peering and transit, or much more so on, on net, either at some remote locations where we've got lots of power and space for them, or in the super cores themselves, or as I talk later in the talk, um, we're moving a lot of CDN capacity out to the POPs. Um, and that's the structure we're working with. <clears throat> so um, we, we we plan it to be a highly resilient network. Um, everything is one plus one connected, and or for the CDN, it's uh, one, one for N. Um, <clears throat> we've got uh, dual peering and transit sites, two or three entry points to the super core, and multiple CDNs through the network with load sharing and everything. Um, the intention is that we can serve our peak traffic uh, in the event of a single major failure, and we have had one or two of those. Um, and we've basically been able to sustain service without any problem. Uh, they were building a John Lewis car park and managed to dig through uh, our fibre when we were ha halfway through a major, net major network upgrade, which was um, a, um, a, a bit worrying, but it, it flew. Um, <coughs> so, and, you know, a loss of a fibre is a loss of 80-layer three PARs that may be up to 100 gigs each, so it's a huge loss of capacity. Um, now, the consequence of this is you do have a fair bit of over-provisioning. Over, over We've got eight routers, but when you do the maths and the modelling, it turns out that the largest router capacity you need is about equivalent to the ser traffic served. So with eight terabits of traffic served, we need eight terabit routers, um, which is a handy... Um, handy equivalents. It just happens to be because of the number of nodes we've got and the way we structure our network that it works out that way. Um, so the core router evolution. The network was first built in 2005 with um, Cisco CRS1, quite a big router at the time, uh, 640 gigs per chassis. And that did us for a long time, about five years, which was good because we didn't have to worry about it. Um, but then growth really started taking off. And uh, in 2003, we upgraded to the CRS3, which was basically a fabric and line card swap, a compatible swap. Um, traffic was in the region of 350 gigs and, um, at, when we started with this. And we had a 2.2 terabit chassis. Um, so again, we had lots of capacity for a couple of years. Um, things speeded up a bit. 2014, Cisco had just brought out the NCS 6008. Um, completely new chassis. It was a forklift upgrade. Um, our traffic by that point was starting to hit about 2 terabits. And the new router brought in about eight terabits of capacity. Um, one problem we faced on these upgrades is the new product arrives just in time, which means the old product is just about full, and we haven't got much scope for um, working the migration. We have to be very careful how we upgrade because there's no scope for sort of providing lots of new connections, temporary connections on the existing routers. They are full by definition. Um, and that um, basically saw us through till 2017. Um, and in 2017, um, 
Cisco very kindly made available the um, new router NCS5516, which despite its lower model number has a hugely higher capacity of about um, 55 terabits per chassis. I mean, that really is a big, a big step up and um, has positioned us for quite a few years forward. That's what we're um, rolling out now. And um, we will convert the existing uh, 6K routers into their back-to-back -back form, which will double the, double the capacity. So just uh, what, the, what, what do these boxes look like? Well, they look like, like, like any other router, albeit a rather large one. Um, the 6K has got um, eight line cards down the bottom, one terabit per line card. It's a very full functionality router, has got various options, back-to-back, -back, multi-chassis, and uh, we can go up to about 32 terabits per chassis if you uh, do various fabric and line card swaps and so on, and go back-to-back. -back. Um, this is a box we're replacing it with, looks like another router, rather, rather, rather more boring, that's our lab router I took a photo of. Um, but actually, when you look at what's going on, we're basically packing those eight line cards in a pretty modern high-capacity router. The capacity of those goes into the two top slots of this 16-slot router on the right. So it is a huge step up. Um, this is achieved by a very high level of integration and um, basically it's, 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 it's a lower functionality ruler, router. It's basically an MPLSP router, which will do fine for our purposes and works very well. Um, the other routers just are being made back to back, and that's what a back to back configuration looks like from the back. We've got 96 100 gig connections going onto the fabric cards, which is about 1,000 fiber, fiber pairs. Um, quite, a fi quite a cable management task that. Um, and the interprocessor links themselves are two times 40 gigabits. Um, we can have the shelves a long way apart, but in reality, that, that doesn't work very well. It's um, not, not very helpful f for managing connections, so we've put them quite, quite close together. <coughs> um, and that's how the optics have evolved. You've, you started off 100 gig with these large CFPs, and we're down, now down to the QSFPs um, on the right of that little picture there, which are about probably an eight, eighth of the size of the old, old CFPs. The other advantage is they're used in huge numbers in data centers and certainly in their SR4 mode are exceedingly cheap, uh, which makes um, for very cost-effective connections as well as very high density, which could be achieved on that 36-port um, line card. Um, so how are we doing? Um, the old graph with the cost of the subscriber connection there in the blue dots if we use the newest router with its low cost, high capacity um, effect and short range interfaces, we get something equivalent to the brown arrow of cost reduction. So we are, in terms of our core network routing capacity, pretty well matching the cost of the, the equivalent cost per bit of the line capacity, which is good news. Where you've got to use long um, LR4 interfaces, it's not so good. They're still quite expensive. And we do have places where we have to use LR4 in our network um, for various reasons, but we're gradually taking that out where we can. Um, so in terms of central switching cost, we've, um, we're, we're in a reasonably good position, and we've also got a lot of he um, capacity headroom. Um, so just very quickly going through how we did this migration. When we've done it before, we've built whole, whole new rings of new routers. Uh, that wasn't necessary here. Uh, we could do it over a slightly more um, staged process. So the first thing we did was to drop the uh, new router into the link. The only challenge we faced is that orange um, link on the, uh, on, I guess, the, yes, your, uh, on the left of the new orange router was limited in capacity. So we had to be very careful. We hadn't got any more ports on the old router to um, beef up that link, which is what we would have liked to have done. So we had to be quite, quite careful how we move things over. We had to do it step by step and model it at every stage to check, check that, that, that the existing interconnects wouldn't overflow in the event of failures. And this basically proceeded. And you get to the point where the, um, everything moves to the new router. You swing the old link over to the new router and take the old router out of service. And the last step is to just move it around there and make it back to back. And we've basically done that with three of our nodes now. 
The last one um, is in Telehouse and is more problematic because of um, our existing um, NCS 6K routers are currently in different suites, and so we've got to do a fair bit of shifting stuff around and making space for them. Um, that's, that's what it looks like on a, um, I'm on a timeline. You upgrade one router in turn to um, NCS 5K, and then you take out the old 6K, and whilst you're starting on the next 5K, you can make the, new, the original 6K at the previous node back-to-back. And as I say, this has worked fairly well. The last one to do is Telehouse, um, and that's our, rather surprisingly our lowest um, traffic router, which um, you might not expect, but um, it's, it's given us a fair, bit, a, a fair bit of breathing space to do that. So the capacity issues are sorted. We've got um, a, a new ring, which is sufficient for five or more years. Um, the remaining 6K ring would have exhausted, but we've we can use our non-depreciated current routers in a back-to-back -back mode, which will keep us going for another two or three years on that. And f for any new acquisition of hardware, it's at a very low cost point with the 5516 silicon. Um, so um, that's all looking good. The only problem is um, transponders and transmission have not followed by any mean means the same graph. There's the cost erosion graph, but the thick blue line at the top is how transponder costs and transmission costs have fallen. Um, basically, um, uh, an order of magnitude slower. Um, and there's a reason for that. Ten, 10 gigs, which is where we started, was pretty easy. Um, you just had to modulate a, net, a laser and put a bit of, of silicon to do far-end error correction on it, and you've got yourself a 10 gigabit port. It, looked, it seemed pretty clever at the time, but it was... Um, in in retrospect, a relatively simple way of transmitting. 100 gig is a completely different order. You've got QAM modulation, it uses coherent detection, you've got multi multiple ion Q detectors, you've got two polarizations, so two sets of lasers and now four detectors. Um, ultra high speed A to D converters, masses of very high speed silicon DSP to do dispersion compensation, um, the unraveling the polarization into its correct components and everything else, and stronger FEC. So there's an awful lot of complexity that goes into the 100 gig, um, basically a 100 gig interface, which is getting the same 10 times the data down the same wavelength allocation as a, 100, as a 10 gig interface. Um, there is a cost to that. And so distance is becoming relatively more expensive. So we need to localize. The answer to that is either the BBC approach of cutting your traffic with multicast, or if you, before we can do that, we need to localize our traffic sources. Um, most traffic originates from CDN, either through private peering from Limelight and such like, or on net CDN, 65% in our case, um, or, uh, or from localized sources. So how much can we localize? Um, and we run into practical things like diminishing returns and so on. Um, this is the first place one looks to, C to CDNs from off-net providers, which probably have got multiple connections into our network. Um, problem is, there's lots of backup paths. You have to provide lots of spare capacity for the alternate peering point and then alternate routes through the network. And each of those links, their transmission links, they cost quite a lot of money. Um, so that's where you stand with off-net deployment. Um, move it on net to these remote sites, which is what we initially used because of, they had the capacity for lots of servers. Um, we, we cut down the number of transmission links, but there are still our transmission links involved, particularly when you start providing for backup paths. Um, so that doesn't turn out to be an awful lot cheaper than doing it off net, in fact. Um, a more effective place is to put the CDN in the supercore locations where you're now connecting directly to the P routers and from there directly to the POPs. Um, less transmission involved. Trouble is, you haven't really got the power and space to do that at huge scale in the supercore locations. And again, you've still got a, um, some, some backup capacity to go. What we'd like to do and what we've been doing is moving them to the POPs themselves um, so you're serving the CDN directly into the, the PE routers at the POP and out to the um, subscribers. Um, that's as far as we can practically go at present. 
Um, and then if you need to back it up, you back it up from a, a CDN at one of the super core locations or somewhere else. Um, and a popper to CDN can, in fact, serve other pops as well, and it can serve it quite efficiently because CDN traffic leaving a pop destined for another pop, its first hop is the reverse direction on the pop down links, and there's lots of spare capacity on that that isn't normally used. So that's actually quite an efficient way to use it, but there are problems in dimensioning that. Um, the other way you know, might be to put it at the exchange, um, quite attractive. Trouble is, you don't get really enough traffic demand at the exchange to uh, get the scale you need, and also our BNG architecture doesn't play well with that. Uh, last thing you could do, a lot of this, well, almost all of this CDN is video. It's being consumed in set-top boxes of some form or another. Um, the Sky, mo most Sky broadband customers have Sky dishes as well. It's a one gigabit channel downlink into the Sky dish. You could maybe put um, stuff onto the set-top box. And this, was, this can be done for very, large, very popular programs like Ga Ga Games of Thrones was preloaded onto satellite boxes. So when people did an, did an on-demand, they actually got it off the satellite box, although it looked like it was coming on demand. The consequence was we could, we, we could support a couple of million downloads without any um, impact on the IP network. It, it, we didn't even see it on the IP network um, in, in quantitative terms. <coughs> so that, but, but that, that can only be used on, on very exceptional cases where you're pretty sure you're going to have a, have a high demand. Um, so if you're going to put it at the pop, the challenge you face is um, the classic long tail challenge. You've got a couple of large pops, and then they start to tail off. And you've also got a couple of large providers. Each provider needs its own CDN. There isn't a transparent CDN that we can use at present. And the, the providers are large, but, but they're, they're not that huge, and, there's, and they're at a fairly similar size. So if you convolve the size of the, of, the, of the provider with the size of the consumer, the pop, you get this, this kind of approach where um, I've just taken a realistic but, fi but slightly fictitious model with 20 pops, and um, the green cells with the numbers in them are the number of gigabits that each provider in each pop has to source. And I've said your minimum practical size for a CDN is 10 gigabits. So there's only about um, nine locations where you've got enough capacity to warrant a CDN, and you can localize about 31% of that traffic, which isn't really enough. Um, what we did was we actually put it out to more locations and we served remote pops from a, from a pop that had CDN. Um, when the traffic doubles, things scale a bit better. You've now got 27 deployments where it makes sense. You're serving 58% of that traffic, that total traffic from localized deployments. And um, that's quite a manageable position. Um, you can take it too far. If um, you get a further doubling of traffic, so it's now four times the original, your greater than 10 gig case is 63 deployments with 88% of your traffic localized. But you've got 130% more deployments, but only 50% more traffic localized. And each of these CDNs has to be powered. You have to find space for them. You have to maintain them. So you've probably gone beyond where you'd like to go with um, local CDN. So there is a limit to where, where this can be used. Um, the other thing is it's actually quite difficult to make it work. We, we knew for a long time it would be a good idea, but um, uh, the problem is um, that we've we work with five CDN providers. Each does it with their own way, and some of them are very different from others. Um, and if you're going to localize, if you're going to tell them how to localize and map their CDNs, you have to do it for all your nodes, um, and you have to think about um, how you're going to deal with backup capacity and overflow. We also discovered that um, some of our software status on the BPEs was not sufficiently up to date. We had to roll out software upgrades to uh, make it operate as we wanted. So this is basically how we rolled it out over a period of about two, two and a half years. Um, the first stage was we put in the, pop, the, the local pops and we let each provider do their own lo 
localization, which didn't work very well. We got maybe 40% localization, and the rest, a pop, the rest of the traffic from each CDN at a pop was going off to other parts of the network, which wasn't really what we wanted. We didn't think this was going to work very well, but we, it was a starting point. Then we worked out how to communicate our intentions to each of the five providers and started telling them what to do. And when we got this interface working properly, the localization jumped up to more than 80%, which uh, was a, you know, pretty good. Um, the last stage was basically fixing problems, particularly as related to um, the FTTC GEA interface um, into uh, BT and also um, IPv6 requirements on the PEs. And we've addressed all those, and we're now up to about 98 or 90, 90 per percent localization, which is, you know, pretty good. Um, so that's where we got with that. Um, last thing just to mention is, at the same time, we've been deploying IPv6 across the network. This, again, needed a lot of work and change, and we're up to about more than 5 million customers with um, eligible and enabled, and we're supporting... Uh, all recent Sky modems, three generations of Sky um, router, and some legacy um, earlier Sky supply routers as well. Um, and again, another two-year exercise to make um, to get up to our 90-95% point. So um, I've talked about this, but we've had a great team behind this. Um, we did a lot of forecast modeling and planning, um, a lot of testing and verification, and, it, and the network implementation has gone extraordinarily smoothly. Um, and we've had to juggle resources and so on to make this all happen. And Cisco have helped us with um, early testing and expedited delivery where we needed it. So thank you for your attention. And I apologize to anyone who's heard this before at UKNOF. <laughs> <Okay>, thanks. <coughs> Any questions on this? Uh, yes, there's one in the front here. If you have a microphone, please. Hi, uh, Jamie Stored in City Technology. Um, instead of the uh, traditional sort of client server CDN push, did you look at any peer to peer or content convergent? ways of delivering content to actually use some of the um, spare trip. Well, the trouble is it's, it, I mean, and, and this has been our problem through and through, it's, it, it's not our CDN. We, uh, Sky doesn't run any CDN. It's all, um, you know, Netflix, Akamai, and so on, you know. So, so it, it, it's not under our, our control. We can only work with what we've got, which, you know, there's lots of cleverer solutions, but they take time and, you know, they take a lot of, you know, it's, it's been hard enough delivering mapping intent to the providers, <laughs> you know, one thing at a time. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> um, I was wondering, you were talking about the, uh, sorry, Rob Evans, just, you were talking about how the cost for transponders is coming down at a much lower rate than it. Have you looked at any kind of transponderless network designs, so using CFP ACO or DCO eventually and putting the colored optics in the routers and using a thin transmission layer? Um, well, y yes, I mean, generally speaking, um, the distances we have to go are beyond what you can do on, on um, sort of 100 gig LR optics. A lot of our I mean, all, all our super links are 100 gig. Um, was that what you're talking about, really? Uh, kind of. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about actually pluggable coherent optics. Uh, and pluggable coherent, coherent optics. optics. Yeah. Um, well, you run up against the... Yeah, we've, we've looked at, um, at uh, routers with, um, with sort of uh, um, coherent optic line cards, but the port density is much lower. I mean, we, uh, we're now getting 36 ports per line card, which you'd, you, you wouldn't be able to achieve anything like that at present with, with coherent optics. There's just too much space and power on them. So yes, you're, you're caught both ways. It, that short hop over to the transponder is really cheap. Yeah. 
and, and your, desk, your, your transponder is just a rack of, of, of coherent optics for our purposes. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a trade off. Yeah. <clears throat> Competing. <laughs> uh, hi, Charlie Comsworld. Um, I am maybe not um, the same sort of customer that you're talking about because I, I don't use Sky Broadband, but I do use Sky Q um, Video On Demand. M my only comment is that when my two-year-old is wanting to watch Thomas the Tank Engine and it's taking not only ages to queue and then ages to download, despite the fact I've got a 10 gig connection at home, um, I, I don't know what that says about the CDN, albeit for off-net, where I'm not, on, I'm not a Sky Broadband customer, but why is it that my Sky Q brand new hardware takes ages to queue and ages to then download a, a 200 meg episode of Thomas the Tank Engine? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, um, we do provide... Um, we've got some CDNs in other ISPs networks and... Not mine. And we also have IS... And also not on regional exchanges. Yeah. Uh, and not, not very deep into the networks. I mean, in other cases, we provide the CDN, albeit from Akamai, and connect to other... You know, so there could... You know, on another network, things aren't as streamlined, but I, but I have no idea why... You know, because what you've talked about sounds like a manageable, manageable situation, so I don't know what the it's problem is It's not manageable when you've got a two-year-old screaming at you. Yeah. But yeah. I... Maybe... <laughs> Maybe try Sky Broadband and... Uh, and <laughs> Hi, it's uh, Rich Bradbury again. Uh, you, you talked about hosting uh, five different um, mm -hmm. CDNs in your points of presence, uh, and there's quite a lot of traffic that you have to uh, get going to those in order to yeah. justify that in investment. Presumably that's physical hardware that those CDNs are installing at each point of presence. Is that right? Yes. Oh, yes. It's and it, and it's a problem. There's some places we'd like to do it, and we, we just don't have the space or power to do it. Yeah. Uh, would, yeah. Would, would you would you consider virtualization as a, a way of reducing the cost there, to actually uh, allow multiple uh, CDNs to share one server? Right. S several virtualized CDNs on a phys physical server resource. Well, yeah. I mean, if if they can do that, but again, it's. Um, each CDN provider has its own approach. You know, they, they tend to use very finely tuned hardware you know, to maximize throughput on their own servers. And yeah, I mean, I'm not really up to speed on the sort of, but, but you know, you'd, you'd have to get the guys talking together. I'm, I, I'm sure that will come and would be a solution to the smaller um, CDNs where it isn't practical to scatter it across the network. But yeah, yeah, no, that's a good idea. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry. Thank you, Tim, for a very interesting talk. Yeah,